essentially the hub of this giant effort, and for all of you for being the various spokes, those committees, and the people that are all here are the rim of this giant community effort. And I'm really happy and thankful that Rick Holly has come to speak with us tonight. Rick is the founder of a community open space and park organization. He started the Green Space Cambria Land Trust more than 30 years ago. Was the executive director for a long time, retired, worked as a property manager, and then came back <laughs> and is acting as the interim director at this point. Um, the focus of the organization was on making Cambria a better community. And that's essentially what the Carmel Valley Save Open Space organization is all about, too. Uh, open space preservation, you know, the creation of parks, places for people to go, saving <coughs> views, saving recreational areas, connecting protected spots with trails, and uh, it's just great that you're here to share your experiences with us, and not that we look to you as potentially in, in your organization as a model, but it's a template, and it's something that all of us should learn from. So thanks, Rick. Thanks for being here. All right. Come on up. Well, I'm always very pleased to see a community come together and focus around a particular space in their community that means a lot. And I, just before I got here, I uh, walked in this building, I was taking on a little tour of that space, and, I, and my jaw dropped. So how, how could this piece of land still be not developed in a community like uh, uh, Carmel Valley? I, I was stunned. And the things that I've learned uh, since I've been asked to speak uh, and, and some homework, and it just seems like it's natural to happen. I, I, I couldn't, I can't imagine a better case to win that, that piece of land. Uh, you've, it's so important to the community, it's so important to the surrounding uh, areas, uh, especially with all the, the, the landscape that's uh, the big, the Ventana wilderness and the uh, other ranch lands around here that have a potential to catch on fire. And um, as we all know, things are going to, uh, they are changing. And uh, in some years we're going to have huge amounts of rain, which is going to produce huge amounts of vegetation. And that's when we have the most extreme fire dangers. And then other times we'll be in droughts. So we've, we've got this whipsaw happening in California. And uh, we need to prepare and have a vision, look forward. And what you guys have been doing here is definitely visionary. And I, I think that the federal government, state government, and local government are totally on your side. And how to bring that together for um, uh, and step out of the tribal mode that we're in and come in to this looking at the benefit for everyone. This is a win-win-win for the property owner, for the community, and for the agencies. But uh, let, let, me, let me start my presentation. I, I was just so impressed with this, and I was so impressed with the people that I had uh, dinner with. You guys are so far ahead of the curve um, for the short time you've been doing this. I've, I've talked to other groups, um, and they're in the infancy stage compared to how far you guys have been. So congratulations on so um, I started Green Space with a number of builders. I was a builder, built houses in Cambria. And uh, I, I saw that, um, that what was going on in our community and how it was subdivided, that there wouldn't be any forests left. And as you can see, Cambria is a forest. It's surrounded by rural lands and we have a small uh, probably around 3,500 acres of Monterey Pine. And um, you can clearly see how it's carved itself into the forest. And you put the parcel overlays on the forest, and that's what it looks like. Uh, it's, it's really difficult. And each one of these parcels, and most of them are 25 by 50, 50 by 70, 
parcels, uh, it's really difficult to stitch together some meaningful open space. <laughs> so we, we targeted larger parcels. It really makes no sense to buy a, a lot in between three houses. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. So you're marking of targeting these larger spaces was what we did. So when I moved to Canberra, which was 1973, um, I was a young man. Uh, there was, I was really interested in the environment. Um, I came from a computer background back then and uh, decided that I wanted to, to live in a small town and, and be involved in small town operations and know people when I went downtown. And that's exactly what happened. So I did find out that when I moved there, there was less than 1% conservation in our community. Matter of fact, conservation wasn't even a word that was used. <laughs> people didn't really know what it meant. Um, they didn't know what a land trust was either, and I didn't at that time. I knew what the Nature Conservancy was, and I never thought that we would be involved with that type of land saving. But just to give you an idea, uh, seven, 1973, uh, maybe 1% of that forest was protected. And now in 2018, we have all, everything that's surrounded in green is either in a conservation easement or in fee protection. This big ranch here is probably one that you've heard about. It's called the East West Ranch. It's 400 and uh, 50 acres. It goes across the creek and it, it goes into the in middle of the village. Um, this area here is now in the UC reserve system. It's called the Ken Norris Ranch. That's that's protected on a um, on a, a lease agreement. Every seven years, it's renewed, and the uh, the Giddy family happens to own that, uh, or an heir to the Giddy family. And they let the UC system operate, and they take very good care of it. But their main interest is the ocean. But they do a lot of work in the pines also. And then the Nature Conservancy came in with uh, Green Space was involved with, with all of this, by the way. Uh, we were involved in an amazing amount of things. But uh, I worked with the Nature Conservancy on this piece right here. And that is about 900 acres of pines. And uh, that was going to be developed into a big ranch. And um, there were actually, there's a creek that flows, um, where is it, right here? So they were going to put a dam on that. <laughs> and they were convinced the community and the community service district that we would get water. And of course, you know, water is a big issue on the Central Coast. And of course, that we would debunk that very fast. There's not enough water. Anyway, we have about 50%, uh, maybe 55% of the forest under protection now. Uh, landscapes like this are very hard. We, we target, we just purchased this piece right here. It's five acres. Um, actually, we didn't purchase it. It was, it was given to us, but we had to raise money in endowment to take care of it. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So, um, we started off as Green Space and Land Trust. Yeah, it's, it's a very hard name. Uh, and we, we, we formed as a committee in 1988, and we got our 501c3 in 1989, and congratulations on doing that. That's a big effort. It takes a lot of time. Uh, we received our first grant actually the same year from the Coastal Conservancy, and it was to do a, a project on the lower Santa Rosa Creek uh, watershed creek flows through town, and we wanted to put a trail on it. That was kind of our mission, sort of the committee, is put a trail. But uh, after we started implementing the, the grant, our, we, we learned our first lesson about public perception. And the ranching community went berserk. They thought we were going to build a trail right up the whole main stem of Santa Rosa Creek on their property up to the, the source. And they were totally against us, and we had a lot of bad press, and it took years to unwind that. It, literally years. That, that got Im imprinted in their minds, and we, we, uh, we were essentially uh, not 
in good standing with them. But the other thing we found out about that, about how important it is to have public per good public perception, is that we learned that we had a lot more friends than enemies. Because a lot of people wanted to see the trail, and it wasn't to, it was only, it was from the mouth through town to the high school. So there was an access to you know, a trail for bikes and for people to walk. Um, so we learned our second lesson as we moved through this, and that was an internal in, internal conflict within our, our organization. Um, we decided, well, I decided that since we lived in a forest, we, we needed to start looking at the trees, and there was a conflict there. And the organization broke apart into two groups, uh, and they started their own land trust. It didn't last, it failed, uh, and I, I, it, it was a very disheartening thing for both me and my, my fellow, uh, my, my friend, um, he since has died, but uh, it, it was one of those things that could have been avoided if we had a good mission statement. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But Green Space ended up doing so much more than uh, just putting a trail in. We, we, bought, we targeted land, we did fisheries work because we have a steelhead fishery, just like I think the Carmel River does. Um, uh, we did a lot of lobbying work in uh, Washington, D.C. on behalf of the Endangered Species Act and funding different um, agencies that provided grants for, for 501c3s and for age, other agencies. Um, and um, we did a lot of land use issues on projects that came into our town that weren't necessarily a good fit, or at least their idea of a good fit didn't match the community values. So we, we did do a lot of advocacy. A lot of land trusts don't do that, but we chose to do that. Cambry has about uh, 6,500 people, and we have about 1,000 members, and that fluctuates up and down every year. So the importance of a mission statement, it's, I, I feel this is really important for any group. A mission statement will keep you focused on, on what you're doing. You, know, you, you have clear boundaries, and you, you don't stray. And uh, it's easy to stray and get involved in something that you, the rest of your group doesn't necessarily want to do. It's not to say that everything's going to be rosy, because your mission statement is, is full of stumbling blocks, and you have to expect the unexpected. But a mission statement is real important. It gives your donors and your membership a real clear vision of what, what you're up to, and it keeps your directories focused. So things that I learned about raising funds uh, to save land. And um, I, I saw your book, uh, and I looked at your, yes, uh, I looked at your website. Uh, land always has a story. And the people who own the land, especially if it's the original or, or, or an owner that's had it for many years in their family, there's a story behind that. And that story is part of your community. And involving the owner with that story and learning about it is really, really key to making a successful project if, if the land is for sale. And even if it's not, you establish a, a rapport, and if it ever does come for sale, uh, you will be looked on favorably. Uh, you want to know the physical property, if there's endangered plants on it, or if there's uh, the migration of animals that come there. Um, drainage patterns, if there's a wetland, all those things that uh, involve the physical aspects of the property. The property that I looked at was definitely altered. It's a big landing strip, but it's right in the middle of a community, and it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, the other thing is, you always expect the unexpected to happen, because it will. I mean, it will. You, you'll be There'll be a brick in front of you, and you got to step over it or go around it. But you got to deal with it somehow, eventually. Uh, when you do buy property, it's always nice to have some money to manage it if you decide to keep it. So you want to establish an endowment fund. Because taking on a piece of property 
in, in telling your donor, donor community that you're going to take care of it and protect it, you need something to protect it with. You can't be fundraising all your lives. So you've got to do that right up front and establish a, an amount of money to, to care for it if you decide to keep the property. If you're going to transfer the property, that's a whole other issue. Um, and what I found out, it, the, kind of the hard way, uh, people donate money for three basic reasons, at least in our community. And that's not to say that this is the same for your community. But these three things are, are pretty consistent, and there's some variables to it. People give money to organizations because they like the person who asks. That person usually has some standing in the community or, or knows the person well, had a good reputation. Um, the people that they are asking um, have trust in that person and the organization. And that's a real important thing. It works. People also give money because they fear of something. And it could be development. In this case, it might be uh, uh, fire. And you have a, an airport that's historically been used for, for agencies to use to help combat fire. And then they have something to gain. And that gain could be uh, a tax benefit, actually. It could be some notoriety. Uh, it could be all sorts of things. But those are the three things that I found um, why people actually give money. And occasionally, there's something that comes out of the blue uh, also. But uh, those are the three main components that I've found in, in my 30 years. So saving land is a, uh, is a balancing act. You've got a lot of competing forces. Uh, you know, people who want to buy the land to develop it, people who want to buy the land to conserve it, people who want to conserve it have different ideas of how it should be conserved or how it could be used. Uh, dealing with developers, uh, you might have to compromise your own values to get it, perhaps. You, you just don't know. But it's a balancing act, and you always have to be prepared for the unexpected. And that's why a mission statement and a clear vision of what you're doing is real important, because it'll keep you on track, keep you out of trouble. And like I say, you've got to define your project very clearly. We, we, uh, we got a uh, $300,000 grant from Fish and Wildlife to do a uh, management plan for steelhead that uh, go up the, the main stem of Santa Rosa Creek. And that's about 16 miles long. And then there's a sub watershed called Perry Creek that runs this way. But that, that's our, that's the, the project. It's not over here on this watershed, not here, and not here, and not here, and not there. And that's what we, we put forward to the community when we did this. And I had no idea how many people didn't like me when we did this. <laughs> because people don't like government coming in. And this was totally a, um, uh, a uh, it wasn't a mandatory plan. It was a volunteer plan. This is what, you, if you do this and this and this, you could get money to help the fisheries if you did something on your property. But most of the conflict came from up in the upper watershed. And uh, these are large parcels of land up here. And uh, it's not to say there isn't down here, but we get the most, most pushback up here. And a lot of articles, you know, bad way to spend money. But eventually, after two years, we got the plan approved. and. Uh, and now it exists, and we do find that some of the ranching community and even the district, our community service district, who uses the most water in the watershed, are actually looking at it seriously now. So having, uh, having a clear boundary of what you're trying to do and then knowing the end game so you can tell your, your constituents what that is. So if you're successful and you decide you, you own it, and then what do you do? You know, and I, I did this because a lot of people are, tear down your project over time. You have to keep rebuilding your wall. It's got to be defined. 
Now this wall is probably 3,000 years old. It's, it's, it's in uh, Korea, outside of Seoul. Actually, I was there a couple of years ago. And uh, that's how I kind of have to look at what, what you're doing with, with a piece of land. You've got to protect it. And, um, and if you decide you're going to turn it over to another organization or agencies, you have to know exactly what you're turning over and how, you want, how your constituency wants to protect it. So that goes into the deed restrictions if you, if you flip the land to another agency. Uh, so if you decide to keep it, then you need to know how much it's going to cost every year. And you have to have the funds to take care of that. And uh, you, you get a, an endowment, and you don't want to use the principal, you just want to use the interest. That was, that's the ideal kind of endowment. And, um, and you have to figure out what that cost is. And lo and behold, there, there is an organization that did actually write a, a computer program that will give uh, different groups an idea of how much it costs to preserve certain lands based on the constraints that you put on it. So uh, that might be well worth um, So developing a good database of, of your community, who, who's, what their addresses are, in contact with them. Databases are so important now. When we started uh, ours, uh, computers were, were just, that was 30 years ago. I mean, I, I bought a, 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 a <laughs> forgot the name of it, what machine it was, but it cost $12,000. <laughs> it was, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it didn't work very well. But, and getting data, good data, was very difficult. You know, it was all on paper. And, you know, <laughs> Nowadays, it's different. Yeah. So having a good database and, and raising to raise funds is real important. Uh, when we started our business in, in saving land as a business, um, social media wasn't around. So we relied a lot on newspapers. But as we developed our organization over time, we, we got into the social media. And it's real, real important. Um, and, especially when you are attracting a younger people. Older people, like myself, I still like to read a newspaper. I like to have a book in my hand. So I, I'm still connected to paper. Uh, a lot of people have moved from that and, and they can look at a digital screen and be fine. So um, both are real important. And, and this book that um, you developed, we used to call these pretty books. And this is what we used to go to donors and agencies with to show them the property. And it's really a wonderful thing. And you guys have done a great job with this. So congratulations. Uh, I remember the first one I saw was developed by the Trust for Public Land when we bought the uh, Sir Sir Ranch, or they bought the Sir Sir Ranch that was uh, an extension of the Los Padres National Forest. And they went to Congress with these, they had a group of painters, uh, plain air painters from mm -hmm. San Luis that came and did a paint out, and they brought all these beautiful paintings of the land to Congress and had a party. A lot of congressmen bought the paintings, they loved the book, and lo and behold, uh, they earmarked money to buy that ranch, and now it's part of uh, the public domain. So it takes all time, but it, this is a real good tool. Um, personal contact, I think we talked about that. Uh, that's real key, making personal contact with all your donors and um, developing uh, a trust and a relationship with them. Partnering with uh, non other non-governmental organizations is real, real important, as is agencies and your congressional members, your, your elected officials. One of the things we used to do, and we still kind of do it, is we develop installment plans. So if you, you buy a piece of property and you've got a, a mortgage, you develop uh, 30, 40, 50 people, 100 people that donate money every single month that go to pay, pay that property off. And uh, some people fall by the wayside because of uh, illness or death uh, and all sorts of things, but you have to be prepared for that. But it's a real good tool. Uh, grant writing uh, is, is essential, and you make that relationship with agencies 
and, gov and non-governmental organizations like the Packard Foundation and uh, the Legacy Fund and people like that that, uh, that give money out for projects like this. Um, and then another thing that we've used is we've optioned land so it doesn't sell and we're on the hook to perform and we usually have a timeline on that and if we don't perform we lose the money. And uh, it, it, it's a little bit uh, nail biting <laughs> when you start risking money like that, but we've been successful with that. And then other things, um, I, I noticed that you have this little patron wall out here, the bricks, names. That's another thing we've used on uh, some of our lands that uh, we made parks out of. We sold bricks for $500 each. and. Uh, We've raised, just on that one park, it was like $70,000 for bricks. It was great. People were happy to do that. And then, of course, the other thing is the endowment fund again. Uh, so you need to know your issues. Uh, these are some of the issues on, on the land that we, we look for. There's, there's plenty more. Um, the aesthetic benefits and how people use the land the economic benefits that it turns around and gives the community is, is something that's really, it, it's hard to put a value on it, but it's huge. It's really huge. Recreation is a huge value. So here's a couple of case studies. Uh, this is a, a property called Wales Triangle, and it's, it's in one of those, those uh, landscapes that had all the, the development lots on it. Uh, it's, a, it's a native resource. It's a registered California uh, tree mash site. It was under immediate threat of development. So we needed to develop a partnership. This, this was kind of early on in our thing. So we made a partnership with the Archaeological Conservancy out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, uh, the agreement was they pay half of the property, we pay the other half. So. Um, we agreed on that, and this is uh, this is the triangle, and the, the green is lots that we purchased, and that happened to be one house on it. So there's there's uh, three lots three lots left, and um, uh, the archaeological conservancy has paid its half for each one of these, and a lot of the money that came from this came from people who surrounded it, that protected their views. And um, this particular person, uh, this had a 120 degree ocean view. It sets up high. It was probably worth $150,000, and we bought it for $25,000. So we bought it at a bargain sale, and the woman got a huge tax benefit. Uh, we paid uh, full price for this, and we paid full price for this, and this piece was given to us. But you need to establish the motivation for people to do that, and our uh, on this particular thing, we want all those those lots under protection. So it's taken 15 years or so to do this. It's, it's a long-term effort, and properties on the coast are very expensive. So uh, another case study I'd like to share with you is Strawberry Canyon. And uh, this is one of those green spots that wasn't developed uh, on that first map I showed you. And you, you can see the hard, hard urban line. And uh, uh, this is the Ken Norris Reserve. And our property was bought in three segments right in here. And um, it's one of, one of the remaining stands on the west side of Highway 1 that, that hasn't been encroached with development. It's parceled out, uh, but we stepped in and we bought it, but we, did, we bought it in three segments. And um, we used the installment plan, we wrote grants, we optioned one of the properties, then we got one in a foreclosure sale. Um, the installment plan was the first one. It was a three-acre piece, and the people that were surrounding or looked down on the canyon all made payments every month. We had a 15-year payoff on that. It, no, it was a 10-year payoff, and we paid it off in seven years. Only two people had to drop out, and we found others to take their place. 
during that, the, the second piece of property came. And I had made a good relationship with the owners. They were from Southern California, and they wanted to build a large house on this property. It was 12.6 acres, I believe. And um, <clears throat> um, that was kind of their fallback position. They had other properties they, would, they wanted to build on, too. So uh, we walked the property, and I told them that we just purchase this. We would like to purchase yours, and we'd like to purchase the surrounding. Area and they they were very cooperative and they said okay we will take it off the market for a year and and uh, uh, write a grant I said that's what we're going to do and we wrote a grant we didn't get it so they put it back on the market we stepped in and and said look um, we know we can get this money we're just going to write it, the grant differently and and uh, we'll make your property payments for you. So we optioned the property, knowing that we may lose a year and a half worth of payments, and uh, I can't remember what they were, but they were $2,500 a month or something like that. And uh, lo and behold, we got the money. It was a half a million dollars. That's what they wanted for the property. And we, we got it through a state agency, Caltrans, actually. And they gave us the money for work that they were doing on Highway 1 where they destroyed um, different grasses and um, the, the carbon impact and Monterey Pines have a, a good carbon uh, print and uh, we got the money. And it was, it's got a trail on it, people use it all the time, it's wonderful. The third one uh, came in a foreclosure sale and uh, to make a long story short, uh, many years ago that was uh, a, had a water meter, a, a developer was going to build a house, it's a five acre piece, and he was spreading this, this house on the entire five acres. And we're talking about really in prime terrestrial habitat and really pristine Monterey pine stand. So I appealed it, Green Space actually appealed that. We don't normally do that. And we forced him through the Coastal Commission to build his house up front, closer to the road and leave the back open. And uh, that's what was cited, and he then sold the property. It went into uh, another hand, and, and then the recession came. And those people uh, sold it, and another couple bought it. And they were completely out of the picture within a year. They, they couldn't hold on to it. And you know, what's in your wallet? People, they, they owned the property, uh, and, they were, and the bank in Texas actually owned it. That was a Capital One bank, and we bought it from them. And fortunately, they didn't know much about our area. They just thought it was a, a, a lot, and it had a water meter on it, big deal. But uh, water meters in Cambria, right before the recession hit, were going for $375,000, just the water meter. Not the land. No kidding. Then you buy the land. Then you have your plants, and you go through the coastal permit. So you, you can easily have five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars into your project before you even put a shovel in the ground. And that's how crazy it was. So this bank didn't know about the water meter. So uh, we we uh, offered them. Um, I think it was one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars to the property. They said yes. We. Uh, the recession was in full blast. The water meter prices had collapsed. We could only uh, sell the water meter for 125, <laughs> so we only had to come up with 50,000 dollars, which we had in the bank and uh, in our, our property acquisition fund. And we also raised 20,000 dollars in the community around this for an endowment fund. So we used that to take care of hazardous trees and so forth. So Strawberry Canyon, uh, you know, it's really hard to get a picture. But when I said um, expect the unexpected, that was going through our property. And uh, that, that second piece of property we bought had an easement through it, and it, it was a sewer easement. And I got a call Saturday morning, uh, Rick, we're going to be running a bulldozer through your property. You might want to come down here. <laughs> So I, I 
unfortunately, I only live about five blocks from here, and I got there, and um, at least they were taking the bulldozer right down and clearing the path so they could come in with some excavators. But fortunately, having lived in the community for so long, I knew some of the people who worked for the sewers district that clean out sewers that get clogged up. And they said, we can do it three manholes up, real close to the front of the property. So we took the bulldozer out, and they did that. We only had to you know, clean up about uh, 300 feet of road that we had to restore. So inspect the unexpected. When you buy a property, you never know what's going to happen, especially if there's easements through it. Uh, okay, this was a park we made in, in downtown Cambria. It's called the Creekside Reserve. We bought it at a bargain sale. Um, it, it was, I think, around six hundred thousand uh, dollars. We bought it for one hundred thousand dollars, I think, less than the the appraised price. It had a cultural resource on it, and it was a Chinese temple. And it was the last out of five left in California that hadn't been um, restored. And it was attached to a house that uh, had caught on fire uh, before we bought it. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute. <clears throat> so uh, we, we had this cultural resource. Um, and we wanted to preserve it from be becoming a parking lot. And um, we found out later how much that cost. Uh, it was unintended consequences, so to speak. It wasn't a bad thing. We really learned a lot, and it's a big benefit to the community and for the state of California, I think. But one of the things we negotiated was uh, a delayed payment on it. So like, we didn't have to start making payments for a year, which gave us a lot of time to raise money and get things in order. And we, we wanted it interest-free, so interest wasn't accumulating. That was a negotiation that took place and it was agreed upon. And we also did an installment plan where a lot of people in the community were giving us money. And um, I, I sat there in my office, uh, I was trying to, I was raising $10,000 at that time every month. That <laughs> was just me, I didn't have, didn't have any staff. And uh, it was, uh, actually I had, I did have, I'm sorry, I had a person, one of my board members worked for free in the office for eight years. And it was, it was a, and that was an angel. <laughs> um, um, so we did an installment plan. <clears throat> and then an angel appeared, because we were struggling. Because we didn't, you know, we, we were making the payments and everything, but I couldn't see how long I could do that for. Because we were wearing people out. And an angel appeared. And this person gave us uh, a quarter of a million dollars, which paid off the property. We, bur we had a big party. We burned the note. We had a monk come to be in front of the temple. Uh, we had Chinese dancers. It was a big event. We burned this you know, the mortgage up. And, uh, and we had an opening event after we restored the temple, it sold bricks. We stored the temple, and we had a grand opening. And two days later, the same person gave us another quarter million dollars to, to take care of the property. Out of the blue. It was, it was fantastic. You can't believe how good I felt about that. And the connection that that, that property had with the rest of the community. It was, it was really something. So, that property, I, this is just part of it. I put it in my eye. Uh, it, this is just part of it. It's a, one in uh, seven point acres, but it was just full of stuff. It was just trashed. Uh, this is before it, this house burned. This house next door caught in a fire and burned to the ground, and part of this burned. So we, we were stuck with, uh, you know, not only we get the property, but now you got develop it into a park. So the, the, the house that you saw standing, that's what it was when, when we bought it. This is the temple. Oh. <laughs> and uh, when they had the San Simeon earthquake, uh, this thing was, was on rocks, on piers set on rocks. And it was, you know, 
it was really precarious. We thought it was going to collapse, and we put beams under it and, and uh, tied everything off to keep it from falling down. And uh, then we had to raise money to move it and relocate it, get a permit. It took 18 months to get a permit mm -hmm. to move that building and restore it. And we had to hire a, a, a Chinese archaeologist um, from the Bay Area, excuse me, from Southern California, and uh, a restoration specialist. And, and, and they did this for hardly any money. Uh, so we're very grateful for that. They were, they were very keen on this since it was the last one. And we, we, we made a development plan, and we restored it and moved it. And um, uh, it's right here now. And we, then we restored all the trees. This is one that was in blossom and has a path that goes back to the creek. But right before we bought it, bam, this went up. <laughs> That, that property was called the Red House property. And um, this was in this man's family at one time. And the family died, and this, the, the sister inherited this part. And he had the part where the house burned down. And uh, it, it was a very sad family um, squabble. And um, I, I was friends with the woman who owned this property, and I, she died, and I, I knew her husband, and that's who we made the arrangements with to buy it. But the other side of the family never forgave us, and it's, uh, it's always been a problem, and it will be in for a long time. Those some things just never go, go away. So we restored the building, and that's what it looks like now, and it's got actual doors on it now. That I don't have a current picture, or at least I couldn't find one. And uh, it's ADA access, and it's a beautiful downtown park, and, and right in the middle of the commercial area. <laughs> so wrapping it up here, I just want to let you know, <laughs> from my perspective, from our perspective, from our experience, <clears throat> having public open space and it's, uh, in a community enhances the value of your property, uh, gives the community a sense of well-being. Um, a gang uh, type of activity goes down because there's trees. That's all these little side effects you would never guess. Well, one of the things that uh, I have to deal with, since we do have a public park, is, uh, is homeless people. And uh, you get to know them uh, and you know their habits. And uh, once you establish uh, a line of respect and treat them courteously, they, they will do that back. So um, it takes time to develop that. And when the highway was closed, it was a bottleneck in our community where all the people that would go through the highway up stopped in Cambria, and we had just a huge, huge amount of people that didn't have homes and had substance problems. So that, that was one of the things that did cost my time and a lot of emotional time, too. But, uh, all in all, the community benefits from all this. So I really congratulate you for taking this project on. And I, I just, I know it's going to happen. I don't know how it couldn't. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, are there some questions? I'm interested, I'm interested in how you found that angel who appeared twice. Did you approach <laughs> that angel? Was that angel a local resident? Or give us some background. Well, I'll give you some background without giving her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she did not live in our town. It was a woman. Uh, uh, she lived in Los Osos, if you're familiar with that. It's on the other side of Morro Bay. Um, she just, I, I, she had been to a few of our events, so she was aware that we were trying to buy the property. Uh, she's an artist, so she had paintings in some of our galleries. Um, a matter of fact, just to let you know how, how these angels happen, she wanted to build us an office. We had an office. We had a, 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 an architect from New York City come. It was paid for by her. It happened to be her brother. The Cambrian designed a beautiful building for us. But, so 
this, so this person just came out of the blue. Uh, I vaguely knew her, uh, and she was very much, um, very much attracted to what we were doing. And when we had our grand opening, she was there. I was standing on the balcony there at the uh, on that uh, temple, and I was looking at her, and I was saying, you know, for. all the people that come here, you know, they come to visit and uh, lover, uh, lovers come and sit on the benches and they steal a kiss and that sort of thing. And they form their own legacy with that part. And she was listening to that. And uh, that's what I think got her to. Man, that's great. And I, I'm part of that. I made this happen. She actually made it happen. You know, we, we set the vision. We stick, just like you're doing got a vision, and you're, you've established it, and people will see it, and they'll understand it. And uh, anyway, that's how that happened. You're welcome. Yes, <laughs> In the process, did you have any lot of trouble arriving at a consensus about how the properties would be used once they were purchased? Was that very clear in your vision statement? Yes. Yes, uh, and I wish I could. I used to know my our vision statement by heart, <laughs> and I, I don't now. But we had to add a few things. We had to add cultural resources. That wasn't part of our vision at all, and it wasn't part of our mission. But as we started conserving properties, um, we had a Chinese temple. <laughs> you know, it was attached to a house. We vaguely knew that, but we didn't uh, realize the importance of it. And um, so we, we had to deal with it, and, and it was a wonderful experience. So we, we, we did, we, we have a, a retreat every year where we go back and reestablish our vision with our board of directors, and we either tweak it, leave it alone, or change it. But we've never really changed it dramatically. Yes, ma'am? This may be kind of an awkward question, and there may be people in this room that can help correct what I'm about to say, but as a community member who's volunteering, my understanding is that the owner of the property is asking for a lot, wants us to have it, but is asking for a lot more money than it's been assessed at, um, because she has so much invested in it, is what I've heard, and wants to make money from it. Could be very understandable. We all have a living to make or we have our money to deal with. Um, but it, it seems like it's it's an area where we're going to have some difficulty coming to um, being able to buy it. Maybe we're just going to get a ton of money coming in and it won't be an issue. But it could very, you must have, with all this experience that you have, dealt with someone who is for your project. Um, but wants more than it's been assessed at, um, and or you know that's something we're going to have to to make her price possibly. How did you deal with, with Boy, that? That's a really good question, and I, I, and I can give you a couple examples. Um, first of all, uh, we, before we uh, move forward with buying a property, uh, we always establish a price, and. and um, and there's a couple of ways we can do that, but the, the best way of doing it is to agree with the property owner, the landowner, on who they want to have it, have it assessed, and you, and you can split the cost. The, 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 the bulletproof one is a MAI appraiser. They've, uh, it's a master's of an appraisal institute or something. I, they, they, it costs a lot of money, and they, they look at a property in ways that you wouldn't believe, and they come up with a fair market value. And um, you can agree with the owner that um, if you don't like it, what 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 would you want for it if it's more? Um, a, a nonprofit um, often is kind of hamstrung a little bit by paying more than fair market value for things. Unless there can be a special case, and, and this is a public safety case here, if you're, if you're going to be using it for staging ground for, um, for natural disasters. So there's, there's your way out of that. Um, 
The other thing is um, the property owner may have some tax um, advantages by selling it for less when you don't know that and you should never give tax advice but you need to give them the information that they can share with their tax advisor. A case in point, we wrote a grant based on an appraisal that the property owner agreed on. We got the grant. The grantors came and wanted to look at the property before everything was done. The property owner was there and she said, I, I want more money. <laughs> we lost the grant. Oh. It was, it was stunning. It was very embarrassing to have to uh, do that, uh, and the, the, the grantors understood. I mean, they were, but so it went to someone else. That money went to someone else, and the property still sits there. So things happen. Other questions? One more, uh, great. Um, talk about opposition groups within the community. You must, you must have thorns in your side. People who are against your group, counter it, attack you. Yeah, you know, it's um, sometimes it's against the group and sometimes it's against individuals. I was in a building trade and uh, I lost my discount at the lumber yard. <laughs> I, I, lost, I, lost a, I lost a lot of friends that just turned their back on me because I was interfering not justifiably with their livelihood. You know, I was trying to protect trees and, and a forest. And I was still working as a, as a carpenter and uh, still did some work like that. But, uh, uh, you know, you have to have a thick skin. Uh, I, I did take it personally for a while, and uh, and I got over it. And I thought, you know, I'm doing the right thing. So. Thank you. I have one more. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, in regards to defining the use, uh, we have a really strong, um, strong feeling about it being used for emergency response, helicopters, um, fire, um, accidents on our, our ever-increasing main artery here into the valley, um, lost hikers, that's mostly what helicopters are landing there. Um, there are people that want to use it other ways. Lots of people are walking there. You know, the owner has just been so gracious to the Santa Fly in, for instance. Um, so there's a lot of community use already that the owner has just graciously been open to about it. But we have a survey online. Well, how would you like to use that? How did you define, how did you come up with your, your um, solid uh, vision for that property? You know, for your property, how would you recommend that we come up with a solid vision taking that forth to donors as you recommend? Okay. Uh, on, the, th this is, on the three case studies, I'm just going to focus on them. The, the, um, the cultural site with the Chumash site is that people can walk there. We can't put a fence in. We don't dig holes. We don't plant trees. The only thing that's in, in there is gophers. <laughs> and they're great archaeologists. Uh, the, um, the, um, the park, the Creekside Park, um, that was pretty well defined as a park. We were going to restore the temple and open it up as a, as a community. But we didn't call it a park, we call it a, kind of a refuge. You know, from an urban environment, people can, the main, major shopping area, people can go there and read a book, or talk, or relax. So, uh, and it's a private, it's a nonprofit park. We own it, we manage it, manage it. Uh, so that was given, uh, that everyone understood that. The um, Strawberry Canyon was, uh, purchased for hiking trails for the community and no development ever uh, and we uh, used it as a forest preserve. It didn't make it any more complicated than that. And, and one of the ways we, wrote, we raised money is we put benches in mm -hmm. and the bench sales go towards the property. 